Hi there, this is um, a video for years 10 and 11, work that you'll be studying in year 10, but ultimately probably a revision video for those of you going into the exams at the end of year 11. This is for GCSE Media Studies and it's focusing on component one, the first exam you'll take, but it's looking at newspapers in a bit more depth than we would have otherwise, because newspapers will come up potentially in both the first and second half of the exam so it's a really important media form for you to understand and feel confident about so i'll rush through a few bits obviously pause it take notes email me any questions but hopefully this will uh, do a pretty good job of covering areas you might get asked about in the exam so first up you just need to be aware of this obviously the exam the first exam is split into two halves the first half is section a where you will get asked a couple of questions on media language and representations and obviously a little bit of contextual knowledge will need to come into those answers. But if you're getting a newspaper question in that part of the exam then you need to refer to the Sun front cover, Great Britain or Great Betrayal, or the Guardian front cover um, with Boris Johnson and co holding their heads in their hands. They're all you need to talk about unless obviously you get an unseen comparison text. But for section B, if you get a question about newspapers, it will only be the sun that you need to refer to, and it won't be necessarily the Great Britain and Great Betrayal cover you want to talk about, but actually a hard copy that you'll need to study, so a full edition of the sun, but also the sun website as well. So the Guardian will only come up in section A, but the sun could come up in section A as your set text, or section B as the website and hard copy that you will be given to study. Obviously this should all make sense anyway, but it tends to be that one part of the course that people easily forget, and we don't want that because like I say, it could come up at any point. So first of all, we'll look at media language and representation, the first half of the exam. These are the two texts that you will potentially be asked to talk about. You won't be asked about both, but you could be asked about one. There's about a 25% chance that one of these will come up. On the left, you have the sun. And remember, you'll get to look at these in the exam, but you must know them well enough because you don't want to spend your time trying to learn it in the exam. And the sun is, as you will find out, very pro-Brexit. So both of these front covers are to do with Brexit. They date from uh, 2018. And the sun wants us out of the EU, out of Europe. Um, the EU is effectively a, a big group of European countries that work together, make laws, make decisions together, and it affects each and every one of those countries. Now, some people really like that or liked it. Um, the chances are we'll have left the EU by the time you're doing this. But some people really disliked the idea because they thought working together was something really beneficial. However, you can tell that the Sun want us to be independent. We are Great Britain, um, and if you don't vote for Brexit, this is pitched at MPs really, this front cover, but if you're not going to vote for Brexit, then you are a great betrayer. You're letting the country down. And there's loads of imagery and iconography that we'll talk about on that front cover in a minute. The Guardian was very anti-Brexit. It wanted us to remain a part of the EU. It tends to reflect the readership of the newspapers, so most Sun readers obviously agree they wanted Brexit done, but the vast majority of Guardian readers and people who are more liberal and left-wing generally wanted uh, Britain to stay in the EU. And you can see, hopefully by looking at them, that the Sun is very pro-Britain, it wants us to get on with Brexit, but the Guardian is quite enjoying reporting on the fact that Brexit's really not going through very smoothly at the time of publication, the 12th of September 2018. So a couple of key terms that I might refer to and key terms that you should probably be, be using in your essays and answers. Tabloid newspapers are what we sometimes call red tops and the sun is obviously the one that we're studying here. They have very different news values to broadsheets like The Guardian. So instead of perhaps politics and world affairs um, and perhaps economy and issues like that uh, which you're likely to find in a broadsheet tabloids tend to be a bit more gossipy a bit more sensational lots of entertainment and sport 
they target a far more mainstream audience as you can probably appreciate. So they have very different what we call news values or news agendas. Right wing politics, always difficult talking about sort of political ideologies because um, you know people aren't necessarily um, stuck in that pigeonhole but on the right generally speaking they wanted uh, Britain to leave the EU. It's kind of about prosperity and looking after yourselves and accomplishing the, the best you possibly can for yourself. I would say left-wing politics tends to be a bit more liberal, a bit more relaxed, a bit more communal perhaps, and the ideas of working together tend to probably be a little bit more prominent, and therefore the idea of staying in the EU uh, and being anti-Brexit were far more common in left-wing politics and left-wing newspapers like The Guardian. I mentioned ideologies a minute ago. They are the beliefs of a group of people or a particular media product. So The Sun has quite right-wing ideologies. The Guardian has very left-wing ideologies. Readership can be used in a number of different ways. Sometimes readership will um, be used to explain the type of person that reads something. So The Sun has quite a working class readership whereas The Guardian has quite a left-wing, slightly more educated readership. But also readership can be used in terms of data. So readership is sometimes the number of people that will read a particular uh, product or publication. So you'll just be able to use it in either, either context is fine. Headline is obviously a headline. Masthead is what The Sun and The Guardian are on their front covers. So you don't call it a title, you call it a masthead. And just getting your terminology right uh, will get you those extra marks. So I've talked about Brexit a little bit. It was summer of 2016, um, so two years before the covers that you're studying. Uh, and it was a very close vote, so it was only one or two percent really that, that separated it. But we decided that actually we were going to leave the European Union. You can see the map um, in the top right hand corner. We wanted to be independent, uh, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as part of um, the UK. Decided actually we want to take back control, that was one of the big slogans, take back control and we'll look after ourselves and the rest of Europe can look after themselves. Critics, so those on the left, felt this was a bit xenophobic, a bit racist, a bit old-fashioned, um, you know, we used to kind of dictate and rule and we don't do that anymore, the world's in a different place and we're better working together. The EU kind of came together after World War II, so it was seen as quite a positive thing. Um, but people on the right thought actually enough's enough, we shouldn't be dictated to by other countries. Um, the EU headquarters was in Brussels, so it wasn't even in England anyway. Uh, and why should we have to go over there to make rules and laws that affect us and other people when we could just do these things ourselves? in Britain and put ourselves first. So you can understand the, the benefits uh, and the, the kind of viewpoints of both sides. Vote Leave, you can see lots of newspapers there, The Sun, The Mail, The Express, they're very right wing and they were very pro Brexit. So it was about project prosperity, doing the best we can for us and the rest of Europe can look after themselves. And independence, you know, real patriotic Brits tend to love the idea of independence and being free from the shackles of other countries. And you can see a couple of uh, familiar faces at the bottom left. Remain, so generally more left-wing people, um, saw it as Project Fear. Actually, the Brexit campaign was full of kind of scaremongering. Uh, and also, if we do leave the EU, we're going to get an awful lot of uncertainty. Um, it's not like it's suddenly going to fix everything and I think it's fair to say over the last three or four years we've definitely seen that that came true. And The Guardian and The Mirror there, they're probably the only two left-wing newspapers, maybe The Independent as well. Um, and you can see from the headlines there that they definitely did not want Brexit to happen. So hopefully that makes sense. The Guardian is left-wing and it is against Brexit. The Sun is right-wing and it is very much for Brexit. So if you get a media language question in the uh, exam, which you will, it will be the first question and it will be a 15 marker and you should know that it will be five marks for three different areas. So it will ask you to analyse the media language used in one of your set texts 
according to three areas of media language. So it could be mise-en-scene, it could be characters, it could be narrative, or it could be some of the areas that I've jotted down on the slide here. I think they're the most likely ones to come up. So if the sum did come up and it said analyze the media language, obviously the message they're trying to create is let's get out of the EU. Any of you MPs who are thinking of voting against it, you're going to betray the country. But how are these meanings created through language? So let's just look at some of the language that's being used on the front cover there. Obviously, Great Britain or Great Betrayal is quite a clever uh, headline, and it sets anybody going against Brexit up as being a betrayer. They use data and statistics. So 17.4 million people voted for Brexit. So surely you can't be letting that many people down. So interesting use of statistics there. Uh, they use knife edge to make it seem incredibly close. So every single member of parliament that reads this is going to feel like they must make a decisive decision. It's a huge risk. So they're using lots of dramatic superlative language um, and they call it a simple, tr a simple choice. Um, and they use words like trust or shameful betrayal. So there's a real clear kind of divide being set up through their language. Either you're on the right side of this or you're on the wrong side of it. If you're on the wrong side, you're a shameful betrayer. Also interesting that all of this is anchored by The Sun Says. Now The Sun is the most read tabloid in the country. So when they put that, it's rightly or wrongly uh, very much a voice to be reckoned with. In terms of imagery, and I'm sure that would be asked about, the page is absolutely full of iconic British imagery, whether it's Windsor Castle, Stonehenge, um, Angel of the North, Houses of Parliament, um, they've even got uh, the red arrows and red top buses and minis and all of those sorts of things. These are things that we are very proud of uh, in Britain because they're here or they were manufactured here or they're um, symbolic of our success in the world. Some people might look at that and say it's all a bit old school and old fashioned, but certainly the sun, they're using them as a source of real pride. And of course, they are omitting anything negative about Britain. It wouldn't make sense if you put something negative there. So the choice of imagery is purely uh, positive. Everything there has positive connotations. We've probably talked about mediation remember mediation is when you select what you want to use and you omit take out what you don't want to use and they've definitely used mediation here to put in the most positive imagery and take out anything that's perhaps negative about britain that wouldn't work in this context for them the other thing for language i should have mentioned was the direct address as well you have a choice now anchorage means anything that's kind of placed on the page to direct the reader's opinion, make them think a particular way. Now there's loads of that because it says either Great Britain or Great Betrayal, but also things like The Sun Says. I've mentioned that, but it kind of offers a leading voice. It tells you how you should think. This is what we think you need to agree with us. And obviously the language is anchored by the imagery and the imagery is anchored by the text and the combination of the two makes the readings very clear. Layout and design might be another area you get asked about. Uh, a very bold, very powerful, very direct headline that takes up the whole page. So quite a rare design, this one, um, saved for only the biggest occasions. So the fact that they've taken up the whole page is really rare. There's no adverts, there's no second story. Um, it's everything there. Um, and of course, the color scheme could be talked about as well. But that fits in with layout and design. The red and white is very symbolic of the St George's flag, it's very patriotic and that would be worth discussing as well. The Guardian is very different, so I've kept the same areas of media language but actually um, they are trying to portray Brexit as being a bit of a disaster and there's a lot of ways that this is done on the front page. First of all, the language being used and again you need to kind of have three or four examples ready to use in case this comes up. But just looking at the headline, the Jaguar chief warns Theresa May, who was Prime Minister at the time, so warns a pretty negative word. Thousands is a, a heavy word, isn't it? It's a big number. Jobs at risk from your Brexit tactics. So basically you're playing with people's lives here. So it's a really negatively framed headline. 
Add to that some of the words like cliff edge, horrifying, dangerous, they're all in that article. We're clearly portraying Brexit and these Conservative ministers as being really reckless, really dangerous uh, and pretty inept at their job. And there's lots of other quotes and bits in there that you could pick up. In terms of imagery, there's some really interesting juxtaposition going on there. We've got three people with their heads in their hands. They look like they're really, really struggling. Now, these are the politicians that promised us that Brexit was going to be really easy, um, really prosperous, brilliant for the country. Now, of course, the image does not look like that's what's happening at all. And The Guardian are loving that because they didn't want this to happen in the first place. Now, you can discuss their body language, but add to that we have their slogan in the background, from Project Fear to Project Prosperity. Now again, this does not look like prosperity. So it's a really nicely framed image from The Guardian's point of view, because these are the guys who said everything was going to be prosperous, yet quite clearly, judging by their body language, that's not what it is at all. Add to that the anchorage of the headline. I'm just dropping down a bullet point there. Thousands of jobs are at risk from this. So suddenly we've got conservative politicians who have this slogan behind them, Project Prosperity. Sounds like it should be great, but actually with their negative downward body language, their heads in their hands, and somebody impartial, the chief of Jaguar, saying, we've got loads of jobs at risk here, you're messing things up. Suddenly it paints a really embarrassing picture of conservative MPs and supporters of Brexit, and that fits the ideologies of The Guardian and The Guardian's readership. So I've talked about the anchorage there, and that obviously fits in with layout and design anyway. It might be that you just talk about anchorage if layout and design comes up. The other thing that's quite relevant is the bottom right-hand corner, and it's Orban versus the EU. So Orban is the Hungarian Prime Minister. He is also very right-wing, so his views are very different to the Guardian. But remember, the Conservatives are right-wing, so if he's right-wing and he's horrible, and he's known for being pretty horrible by Guardian readers, and we're putting him next to these failing Conservative politicians, next to this headline, telling them that they're terrible. It's a really powerful triangle that sort of says right-wing views and people who are pro-Brexit really are not doing a great job at all. The other thing you might want to reference is the top right and the economic crash. So they're associating this failure with potential economic disaster, which nobody wants. Make sure you know who these three are. So Jacob Rees-Mogg, you'll probably know. He's a bit of a pin-up boy for really right-wing politics. So Guardian readers will not like him one bit. Boris Johnson is obviously now a Prime Minister, but at the time of this publication, he was just a Member of Parliament. And then Peter Bone is the Chairman of the Conservative Party. I've mentioned Viktor Orban already, but they kind of get coupled together to emphasise the Guardian's point. So that was media language, but remember media language and representation kind of go hand in hand anyway, and you will get a representation question, which again might be based on either The Guardian or The Sun. So you need to think about what kind of issues or people or social groups are being represented, because it might not tell you what areas to focus on. It might just say, discuss the representations created in The Guardian, and you're going to have to think on your feet. Am I going to talk about males? because it's only males there, so it could be a gender-based question, and that might be quite interesting. Or it might be actually that The Guardian, not really focusing on gender here, but they're focusing on politics, right-wing versus left-wing, or conservative politicians, or pro-Brexit politicians. And you need to think about that. Now, I would argue that conservative politicians here are, are basically, they're taking the piss out of them a little bit, because they are tired, struggling, ineffective, they look inept, clueless, ridiculous, out of their depth. Okay, now some people will agree with that and some people will disagree, but remember that's what The Guardian are trying to create as a representation. And Brexit, while well, it's being presented as a risk, that's exactly what the Jaguar chief is saying, and we're going to potentially mess up the economy by doing this as well. People are going to lose their jobs, manufacturing is going to suffer, and this is all because of your selfish government trying to get a deal for something that wasn't even worth trying out for. So those are sort of short sentences that you could use and then expand upon, but of course we have to expand upon them as well. 
Um, we need to evidence these things. You can't just say, oh, the politicians look clueless or Brexit is represented as negative. You need to tell me why. So sometimes we need to combine media language and representations to evidence how those representations have been constructed. So I've said that conservative politicians appear inept, clueless and ridiculous. But how can I justify that? And there's some examples that you could look at. The anchorage, the framing, the juxtaposition of the image with the headline. And then Brexit, again, very negatively represented here. There's lots of language that really makes that evident. And then obviously that graph at the top as well. In the sun, well, it's an interesting one because although they're pro-conservative and they're pro-Brexit, some conservative MPs aren't voting at this stage for Brexit to go through. So there's a little bit of a conflict of interest for the sun. But Britain is the easy one to talk about. Britain is represented as prosperous and great and wonderful. It's very, very positive. And hopefully you can tell that's quite easy to answer. A couple of stereotypes in there, but otherwise it's a very, very positive representation. Brexit is seen as being the right thing to do. It's what the people have voted for, so let's get it done. But politicians are not getting this done as smoothly and as effectively as they promised. And that's starting to annoy the sun in their readership. And we can see that through some of the language being used as well. So that's media language and representation. Hopefully that makes sense. What we're now going to start talking about is the sun for the second half of the exam and that's industry and audience and on the screen are the areas that you will need to potentially discuss for the sun. Now it could be that you end up talking about the front cover that we've looked at but that's not really what you're meant to do. You are meant to talk about the website for the sun, the home page and a couple of other selected pages of your choice but also a hard copy of the sun that you should have studied as well. So what I'm going to do is pretty much think on my feet. All I've done is taken a couple of screen grabs from previous uh, work we've done or just today's Sun website uh, and try to answer these types of questions. So first up, types of ownership. So they expect you for part B of the exam to understand different types of ownership. The Sun is owned by News Corp and they are a huge, huge uh, publisher. They were part of a massive conglomerate that included uh, TV and radio and film. So 20th Century Fox, for example, they were one of the biggest conglomerates in the world. Now, Rupert Murdoch has sold off most of those, but slightly surprisingly, he's retained all of his publication uh, works, so newspapers and books, as you can see. They're making vast amounts of money, as you can see, 10 billion last year, um, and that's pretty impressive but it does actually show that that's slightly less than they made the year before. And that's unsurprising because fewer and fewer people, of course, are reading newspapers. But still, incredibly powerful, 28,000 plus employees, and they own lots of subsidiaries as well, lots of smaller companies. So the Sun are owned by a huge, huge uh, publisher. Now, when it comes to the production and distribution process, um, that always sounds a bit difficult and weird, but it isn't at all. Traditionally, newspapers were produced um, on print presses and then they were distributed um, literally you know, across the country via um, vans and lorries to news agents ready for the next morning. Now, obviously, not many people buy newspapers now. The news is slightly old. Uh, we're in a world of 24-hour news where we can access it anywhere, anytime, any place. And so, therefore, the Sun, like all newspapers, have had to adapt and they've moved online, which means the production and the distribution of their news and their content is quite different. It's much quicker, it's often a bit shorter and snappier. There's far more multimedia. If you look at the right hand side there, there's lots of videos that you can click on and watch. And also, you know, the production of the news sometimes comes from the audience. Um, we can comment on each of these stories. There's a citizen journalism section uh, where you can sell your story to the sun. Uh, and obviously the production and the distribution has sped up significantly, so they don't wait until the next day to publish news. They have to be on it all the time, 
competing with Twitter, and BBC News Online and 24-hour news stations and so on and so forth. What they've also done is expand their enterprises to social media. So you will probably be familiar with the Sun on Snapchat. One of their stories are always there. Uh, and Instagram, Twitter, you name it. They've made sure, as a very profit-driven company, that they are in every area they can possibly get to. And again, that fits in with the production and distribution of their news. You have to do it in a particular way to appeal to the audiences on those platforms. So Snapchat's got to be short, snappy, colourful. Instagram obviously needs to be very image heavy in the way that you tell your news. So they're adapting their, their processes all the time. How do they aim to make profit? Well, they have to. That's what News Corp want, as you can tell, and they're very good at doing it. There's quite a few things. One of them is the cover price of the newspaper, obviously, but you'll appreciate that they're making money less and less via that method because fewer people are buying the newspapers. So what do they do? They sometimes drop the price of the newspaper to get more people to buy it, and they often advertise how much cheaper they are than their rivals, the Mirror. By doing that, you sell more newspapers. By selling more newspapers, advertisers will pay you more because you're reaching a longer audience, or bigger audience, sorry. But they also put adverts on the front page quite often. So teaming up with Coral there, for example, to give you a free bet, or they'll work with holiday companies to give away cheap holidays too. Now, if I just quickly escape here, um, you'll see, for example, a bit of a rare one because um, you wouldn't normally expect the government to be advertising, but in this time of coronavirus, it's actually the government that are paying for what we call wraparound adverts that take up pretty much the whole of the website, okay? And that will be a, a way of making money as well, not to mention lots of other things that we could look at in more detail another time. So they're doing lots of things to make money. These areas kind of group together. How do they target different audiences? They're obviously trying to reach a very big, broad, mainstream TA because they're profit-driven. How do they try and engage and attract these audiences? Um, so let's just look at some of these things here. Now this is the website homepage that we studied for what is probably the current year 11s. So if you were in year 10 for 2019-2020, this was the day that we chose to study uh, and it was sadly the day that or the day after in fact it was the day i think no the day after <laughs> that kobe bryant died uh, in a helicopter crash with his daughter uh, and a couple of other people as well now that is quite a newsworthy story anyway the death of a, a really famous celebrity far too early on in their time um but see how the sun does it so that's top of their news agenda, which is fine. But the way that they try to target different audiences is quite clear in this homepage. Because if you like sport, well, you've got a picture of Kobe Bryant doing what he did, play basketball. If you're into drama and suspense uh, and kind of shocking news, then a picture of the crash in the middle and the aftermath of it uh, is pretty attention grabbing. If actually you're a family person or you prefer the personal side of news stories, then they've got a picture of him and his daughter with whom he was very close on the right hand side of the screen. Add to that multimedia, lots of videos, uh, forever a legend, fatal flight. Whatever your interest in this story is, they're gonna make sure they cater to it. So it's a really nice little case study, that one. Uh, I mean, it's horrible, but you understand what I mean. Uh, in terms of targeting different audiences, that does it very, very well. If you're not into sport or any of those types of things, then right below there's stacks of showbiz stories anyway. Obviously, you've got the navigation bar with very, very different, but still very mainstream interests across the top as well. Football being the first one, the most mainstream and popular sport ever. So their news agenda or news values are very different to something like The Guardian. Um, not that you need to study The Guardian for this part of the exam. But these are what they deem important in the world. TV and showbiz, football, sport, fashion, money, they all come before politics or economy or world affairs. Um, but it obviously works and they know that because they make a lot of money. 
you might want to talk about how audiences are grouped or categorized traditionally newspapers did it via the social grade a b c one c two d e so upper class middle class and lower class sometimes they're divided into a b c one c two or d e so upper middle or lower class sometimes they get defined in the top half and the bottom half now the sun is generally pitched towards the lower half so lower to middle class people you can probably understand why most of their content is free the newspaper is relatively cheap and there's lots of kind of mainstream interesting stories there now the average reading age in the uk you wouldn't believe is nine years old the sun right at a level pitched to eight-year-olds so again they're not kind of uh, excluding anybody if you read the guardian and you've got the the reading age of a nine-year-old you're going to find it really boring really difficult same with most broadsheets but the sun know how to communicate stories very simple uh, very dramatic very sensational uh, and again that's a great way uh, attracting and engaging your audience <clears throat> Demographics and psychographics you might also want to think about. So <clears throat> demographics are factual information about us, and we've talked about that. It's usually the lower class for these, but there's plenty of stuff for males and females over there, as you'll appreciate. But psychographics are well catered for as well. So just by chance, if you like sport or basketball, well, they've got something for you there. If you like family or more emotional, caring, compassionate type stories, there's things like Dear Deirdre, um, if you're into money, there's lots there about money. Uh, if you're into animals, there'll be a section on that, and so on and so forth. So the point I'm trying to make is whatever your psychographics, whatever your interests and attitudes and opinions on the world, the Sun will try their best to cater for you because they go after a really mainstream and broad audience. This is an interesting one. How my audiences interpret things differently. And the Sun is quite an interesting case study for that because um, they have often been accused of, of kind of uh, stoking the fires of xenophobia or racism. And the front cover that we studied last year um, very much did that. So Freed Jihadi Stabs Two. Now, obviously a pretty horrible uh, situation, but other newspapers wouldn't have brought race into it. However, the Sun very much have, and they often get criticised for doing this. Um, it provokes lots of fear and anger amongst the public, and it draws people in, and it's a good way of making money and selling copies. But some people feel that it is really, really uh, morally a, a pretty bad thing to do, because what it does is it creates a divided society. Um, and that's a perfect example of how audiences might interpret content differently. So if you were to get a question like this, um, then you could very much look at a, a, a front cover like this and some people would think well this is just typical Muslims uh, coming over to our country and creating friction and putting our lives at risks other people would read it and think why is this being so overtly racist some people would look at it and think this boy needed better support our systems aren't working in this country and there's so many different ways you could interpret it same with the Kate Middleton shot on the left there some people will think amazing we love her other people would think well look at all the rubbish that's going on in the world and you're getting excited about the jewels that a princess is wearing so audiences do interpret news differently and the Sun is one of the best out there for demonstrating it because some people love it and some people hate the things that they try to communicate how do audiences use text to shape their identities so this is quite an interesting thing as well uh, we all do it. We all associate with particular bands or political movements or actors or artists or whatever uh, to try and shape who we are. You could do that via the sun because it might be that you read the sun to learn more about sport or to find out more about how to save money or to form your own opinions on particular issues. Write in and read letters that people have written. So quite often we use newspapers and other media texts to shape what we believe and what we stand for. Last of all, uh, for audiences, is the uses and gratifications theory. Now you absolutely will need to use this in the exam. It might not be for the sun, 
but in the second half of the exam you will get audience questions and if it's four, five, ten marks you need to be applying some of the uses and gratifications. You should know them off by heart and to just demonstrate how easy that is to do, how do the uses and gratifications apply to the sun? Well, in terms of social interaction, they have stories that encourage you to talk. They have comment sections. They also have, although it's not on the screen, links to their social media pages where you can interact with people. So there's plenty of that. In terms of entertainment, there's lots of videos to watch, be it showbiz or the actual news. Uh, across the top there, TV and showbiz, sport, fabulous. All of those things are entertaining. Escapism, so things like Dear Deirdre, where you can lose yourself in some slightly bizarre stories that people have written in, would be a good example. There's lots of other things there. For Inform and Educate, well, obviously it's a primarily newspaper, so everything there is informative and it teaches us about particular things. And then Identification, take a look at Kobe Bryant and his daughter on the right hand side there that's a good way of trying to get audiences to identify with this story and again that personal touch is something that you will see across lots of the Sun's reporting because they're trying to trigger an emotional response from as many people as possible so you're going to need your own examples really but that's how easy it is just on one home page and pretty much one story I can see all five of the uses and gratifications being used so the last thing I just need to talk to you about is the regulation of newspapers. You will probably get a regulation question um, for one of your four texts in section B. It could be video games, it could be film, or it could be um, radio. But if it's newspapers, it is, I think, genuinely the most interesting because it's one that's quite controversial. Ipso oversee newspaper regulation. Independent Press Standards Organisation. They're relatively new, but there have been similar bodies for decades. And what they do is they handle complaints. So they don't check material before it goes out because there's obviously too much news every day to check how it's being reported. So what they do is they set up guidelines, a code. And if readers see something they don't like, they can complain. So that sun front page a minute ago free jihadi stabs too i could within my right get in touch with it so and say i think that's really racist i think you're stoking hatred it's really negative uh, and i probably wouldn't get anywhere but ipso would be who i go to if the sun made up a story about me then absolutely i could go to them and say look this is inaccurate it's lies and i need you to do something about it what Ipso will do is they will get the Sun to apologise or the newspaper to apologise. Um, it might even incur a fine as well. Some people think this is all too lenient, but this is how it's done. So the editor's code of practice is what you need to know. Editors are basically in charge of a newspaper and they are the ones that make sure their journalists and reporters and writers don't do anything that they shouldn't, although there's lots of controversy as to how newspapers do operate. Now the code of practice has 16 codes in it, so you have to be accurate, you can't invade people's privacy, you can't chase people and harass them, you can't discriminate. So for example, I would say perhaps there's some discrimination in what we've just read in that front page. And there's obviously 12 others as well, which you should look up, although you won't need to know all of them. Now note that there's an asterisk next to a couple of these. These can be breached, so you can ignore these codes effectively if they are deemed in the public's interest. So, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. In fact, I'll give you a good example because um, I've just seen one on the sun. So, if you bear with me, um, right here. Now, you're going to listen to this six months after now, so you might know what happens, but... Well, there's some chilling pics here that reveal uh, the man who suspected of taking Madeleine McCann kept girls' swimsuits in his mobile home. Now, this guy's privacy is definitely being breached here. However, it is probably in the public's interest to know that there is a paedophile criminal uh, who perhaps took Madeleine McCann. Now, it might not be true that he took her or killed her, 
Um, but the fact that we've got pictures of his vehicle and things that he's stolen, yes, it's invading his privacy, but it's probably completely reasonable to do so. I don't think anybody's going to complain about his privacy being uh, breached because it is in the public's interest. This is a story that has dominated news for probably over a decade. However, if a newspaper um, decided to break into my home or rummage through my trash, trash or whatever, um, that would probably be breaching the privacy code because there's no reason for them to be doing that. Uh, it wouldn't be in the public's interest to know um, what Mr. Benzie's been reading or how much his electricity bill was or whatever. So it celebrates freedom of speech and that's why the front cover I've shown you probably wouldn't uh, be upheld as a complaint, the free jihadi, because that's what the Sun are choosing to say and there's been lots of controversial articles in the Sun especially, Daily Mail too, but there has been lots of controversy. If you look at the phone hacking scandal which involved the Sun, you'll see that they've hacked hundreds, probably thousands of people's phones, some celebrities, some victims of crime, some just everyday normal people and they've ended up having to pay millions and millions of pounds out of court to settle some of those cases and the news of the world which was their Sunday edition got shut down after the Leveson inquiry which was looking into the ethics and the practices of the press who uh, are not particularly innocent. Obviously new technology raises concerns as well because they put their news out in so many different ways on so many different platforms now that it's becoming even harder to regulate than it already was. So, quick recap then, The Sun, it's right wing, it's pro-Brexit, it's got a very mainstream TA and it's profit driven. Obviously think about the media language and the representation in your set text. They're owned by News Corp, they're doing everything they can to reach the broadest, most mainstream audience they can and that includes maximisation of new tech, which The Guardian have of course done as well. Their website is very popular, but The Guardian, the left wing, their broadsheet, they've got a more liberal, uh, more educated TA smaller audience though uh, and they're owned by the Guardian Media Group who are yes profit driven but just as much a voice for the left they want their ideologies to transmit through society and through their readership. So that's that for newspapers I hope that's been helpful um, and good luck in your exam.